Hello, my name's Mike, and this is my commentary on the Superman short, The Eleventh Hour. The Eleventh Hour is actually the twelfth Superman short, and the third one made by Famous Studios. Famous Studios took over for the Fleischer Brothers after they had a falling out with each other and decided to hand their resignations over to Paramount Studios. An interesting piece of trivia about the series is that the original character models came from Superman's original artist and co-creator, Joe Schuster. Now, there's an interesting change in the description of Superman here, where instead of saying that he's superior to a lot of the man-made technologies, they now say that he's superior to some of the forces of nature. This is the second time the description of Superman's been changed in the opening. Originally, it said he could leap tall buildings in a single bound, however, that line became changed to he could soar higher than any plane. Um, something I found a bit odd here, you see, Superman's cape is no longer blowing in the wind like it was in his earlier shorts. Otherwise, this shot is exactly the same, frame for frame. Here we start the story off in Yokohama, Japan's second largest city. Now this is a very, very interesting location to put a Superman story in, as with the exception of this one short, Superman never actually went to any of the Axis powers or their occupied countries during any part of America's war years. There were two main reasons for Superman not fighting in World War II on the front lines. The first is that at this point in Superman's career, he had become much more powerful than he was originally envisioned. He was almost invincible, he was extremely fast, and there would have been almost nothing to stop him from flying directly to Berlin or Tokyo to take out the leaders and stop the war. The second reason is that the writers didn't want to downplay the sacrifices and efforts made by the soldiers and make it seem like they were doing less than their all because Superman was helping them out. And here you'll see the only time in this entire series of shorts where Superman appears on scene before Clark Kent. The way the writers got Superman out of joining conscription was that he wanted to join the war, but when he went in for, to test his eyesight, he accidentally used his x-ray vision and read an eye chart that was in the other room. But despite not joining the army, Superman tried to support the war and be patriotic, as seen with this little exchange with Lois here. It's been going on every night since he's been interned. What do you suppose it could be? Could be sabotage, I hope. Me too. But who? Superman was voiced by Bud Collier and Lois Lane by Joan Alexander. Both voice actors are seen here reprising the roles that they had on the Superman radio serial. Do not talk. The soldier at the back here is sporting a huge set of teeth, which was a very stereotypical trait drawn a lot of the time on Japanese soldiers. With that said, these are some of the more toned down versions of the Japanese soldiers that we've seen in war propaganda at this time. Many of the other times, they were shown to be other complete caricatures or look something like vampires. And now it's the 11th hour, which is where the title of the short comes from. The title can mean two things. It can mean the actual time, the 11th hour, or it can mean a time which is almost too late to do anything. What the significance is for Superman attacking at the hour of 11 at night is never explained. This is the first and only time we'll ever see Superman come out and be the aggressor in a short. As you can tell, Metropolis is not in immediate danger, yet Superman takes on himself to go and try and stop things before it happens. This is very, very uncharacteristic for him, as is causing that explosion, which no doubt killed a bunch of people. You see at this bridge here, yes, all those people will die by the impact of the fall, and Superman has access to explosives. Now we get darker imagery, which is more associated with World War I than in World War II. Again, this came out before America's really started fighting in Europe, so the only real war time stuff they had to look at was their footage from World War I. At this point in the series, the cartoons had become more adult-oriented than either the comic books or the Superman radio serial had ever attempted to be. In fact, once Famous Studios came and took over production of these from the Fleischers, these became less about science fiction and more about wartime propaganda. Only one of the famous studio Superman shorts did not have sabotage as a major plot point, and that would be their second last short, The Underground World. And there we just saw Lois get captured again, which is very in character for her. 
The Japanese seem to be very efficient in writing posters in English and posting them all around the city in one night. And now we're about to see Superman sabotage the way he probably would sabotage if it was in his character to do so. Uh, take out a prototype or a newly assembled vehicle of some kind, make sure that's a large one so that it would not be easy to replace, and do it at night time so that there'd be the minimal amount of casualties possible. And in this case, there's probably no casualties from his action, which seemed much more in character than his attacks earlier on with the Japanese army. And now we're about to see Superman get hit on the head by some loose planks. Depending on where he's standing, there's really nothing that should have caused those planks to come loose, so I'm guessing this is just karma being a bitch. And drumroll please. Would Miss Lane please come to the front to give us what is sure to be a heart-stopping performance? Yeah, I'm sorry for that one. More astute or dirty-minded viewers here might notice the officer's seat and the position and movement of it and come to their own terms of what it might represent. And here we see that the biggest thing that held back Superman this night was not because of the Japanese but because of his own incompetence. And we also see Superman not holding back while fighting with this one. What we get here is the first time in this short sunlight is actually strong enough to light up the character. And what follows is probably the best and quickest paced fight in the entire series of animated shorts here. If you look carefully in the next uh, few seconds, you will notice that Superman shows his eyes and pupils there for the first time in the series. And he steals Lois away to bring her back to Metropolis. What Lois was doing in Japan in the first place and what her assignment was is never addressed. Also, why the Japanese took so long to target her after her arrival coincided with the sabotaging is never addressed. It's one of the major complaints about the series that the story writing was too simplistic. And Lois goes to tell that Clark did not return home with her, but Superman is watching out for her, indicating that she might realize in this version that Superman and Clark are the same person. And it's a rather dark ending for this short, unlike a lot of the other shorts where you get a wink. 